Okay. Can you hear me okay? It's going to be a little bit like a church, but you should be able to hear me. If you don't, you stop me, okay? Uh, well, welcome. This is, I'm Lorenzo Rosasco, and this is the Regularization Methods of Machine Learning. It's a, it's a summer course offered at the University of Genova. Uh, there is a long list of people who have helped me out putting this together, particularly uh, Alessandro Rudi, Raffaello Camoriano and Silvia Villa. They are actually the organizer, they're the one that made things work. I imagine you received at least 25 emails from them, so they might be familiar. There is a lot of people that you're going to see in the labs. Uh, these are the people that are going to help out uh, in the practical sessions. And this is a course organized, it's, it's held here in Genova at the University of Genova, but it's actually co-organized by the bunch of partners of our institution, the Italian Institute of Technology, here in Genova, uh, a bit further up, and uh, the Centers for Brain, Minds and Machines, which is a joint center mostly at MIT with Harvard and a bunch of other institutions. Uh, <coughs> so what I plan to do <coughs> in the first hour and a half is that we're going to go through, say, you know, some initial, you know, 10, 15 slides or just warm up, and that's kind of the only moment where we're not going to rush into material, okay? So uh, the whole course is basically a, a, a shrink up version of a class have been taught at MIT for the last well, whatever years, but by me by the last five, ten years. So. What I decided to do is that I wanted to give you a bit more, maybe quite a bit more, of what you can actually digest in a week. Okay? So the idea is that you should be able to follow everything, but then you will have to go and look at the slides and maybe the next week try to consolidate the material. Okay? So it's going to be a bit fast-paced and we're going to see a bunch of stuff. This is on purpose. Okay? So you have to be a little lost, but not too lost. Locally, not lost, but globally a bit lost, okay? So this is how it's supposed to be. By looking back at the slides and taking the time to go through the material, you should be more than fine, okay? But this is an advanced course. So uh, going back to the presentation, so the actual organizer of the course are the two groups uh, doing machine learning around here. Uh, the Sleep Guru is the historical group doing not only machine learning, but also computational biology, vision, <coughs> and uh, um, and then the uh, lab that has been joined between MIT and IIT in the last few years called the Laboratory for Computational and Statistical Learning. As you see here, there are a whole lot of people. Uh, this is not uh, up to date because yesterday night we could not fetch all the, all the pictures of the people. But this is around 30 people over the world. Um, what you see here has been like the, you know, a, a process of the, the initial idea was, we do machine learning, we don't see a, a course like this, why don't we put together one, okay? So this started almost 10 years ago, well, six, six years ago, and it kept on growing, okay? And this course you see here is really the baby version of the MIT course, so it's the advanced machine learning course. And then, uh, in the time, if a couple of years ago, we said, well, maybe this is a bit harsh. If, you know, we found a lot of people would come here and listen to this course as their first course. And this is not supposed to happen, okay? And so we decided, well, maybe we should also provide another course, which is more entry level. And this is what we call the machine learning crash course. And this is, again, a one-week course. And right now, we are alternating these courses, okay? Every other year, we see one or the other. And the level is really different. One course is you know nothing. You should get to the point where you can say that you know what's machine learning and learn the basic techniques. Here, we take a step up. And as you see, the number of participants has, has been growing steadily. We keep the course free, partially because we try to minimize the amount of organization we have to do, but also because we want you to be able to just come here and you know and listen. We're having a bit of a problem because the number of uh, people that very last minute decide not to come is around 10 every year, which is annoying because it means that among the almost 250 people that actually apply to attend, 10 is gonna, are going to be left out. So uh, we have to think a bit about that. Probably either paying, but I was thinking that maybe overbooking is the solution. Uh, 
what, what will you see in this course, okay? This is meant to be an advanced course in machine learning where you see put together stuff that usually you see or read on papers, okay? I'm not sure there is many other classes or books where you find this material somewhat organized in a coherent way and a unified presentation. Uh, the emphasis is definitely on algorithms. We're not going to talk much about statistics aside from the beginning, just a little bit of setup, but it's really about algorithms, okay? And the idea is that at the end of this class, you will know, you will go through some stuff that you might already know, like logistic regression SVM, but in a different way. And then you will know about things that probably you have not seen or not quite digested, like regularization not based on penalization, like projection or early stopping, and then move on to more recent concepts such as sparsity, uh, matrix completion, multitask learning, and then keep on going, talk about dictionary learning, talk about uh, deep learning, and so on. So these are, these are, if you want, these are not the stuff that we've been doing yesterday, but the stuff we've been doing in the last five years, okay? And this is the, probably the, one of the few places where you can see it um, organized in a, in a way that it can be taught. So this is the goal of this course. This is, I guess, unreadable but it's the syllabus, okay? And basically what you see is that each day has a theme. The first day is basically warm up, learning theory and, uh, and classical supervised learning. Then we go at more advanced regularization techniques. Then there's gonna be the workshop. I'm gonna spend a couple of words in a minute. Then spar the sparsity day and then the data representation, dictionary learning and deep learning day. The morning is the uh, theory part. The afternoon is the labs where you go in and touch with your hands some of course, not all of the idea you've seen in the morning. I'm freezing. <coughs> I'm not freezing, but I'm getting cold. So this year we had, last year at the MLCC, we decided to put together a one day workshop and it worked pretty well. So we decided why not to do it. And this year I have to say, it's basically an excuse to see a bunch of friends all back together. So. Uh, there is kind of a, mach a Genova school of machine learning, started with Tommaso Poggio, and then there is a bunch of sons and uh, nephews. And here you see a list. There is an intruder, Gadi, but he's a cool guy, and so we invited him anyway. So these are all people that somewhat spend their time between Genova and MIT at some point of their life, so we're very happy to have them here. Hopefully it will be fun. Uh, prerequisites of this course. I, I guess the main one is, I hope this is not your first machine learning course, or if it is, that you are, you know, enough maturity in terms of math and in terms of ideas such as statistics and so on, because otherwise you're going to have a hard time, okay? We should, we, this year we checked your curriculum a little bit, so this should not happen, but this is the main prerequisite. More or less, uh, I'm going to cover the basic idea I'm going to use throughout the course, so it's somewhat self-contained, but it's fast-paced, okay? So if the first time you see it, you're going to be a bit uncomfortable in a bit, but I'm around, you have the labs, take advantage of that. You've got a lot of people, you can ask questions. Uh, as I said, somewhat the um, machine learning crash course, which is the short version, is kind of the prerequisite, you know, the one I'm giving for granted. And uh, uh, the whole material you find on Knife 520, the, the long course at MIT, is kind of the, a superset of what you see here, okay? Particularly, I think there are gonna be a couple of versions. I'm not sure that you find them immediately, but because uh, I was not sure I wanted them to be advertised, but you find them online, okay? So basically, pretty much all the classes uh, at MIT can be found online, so you can watch them again, and we're gonna record these ones too, okay? So the slides most likely are gonna be online tonight, okay? And the rest of the slides every day. More or less all the material you can find here. Uh, the one thing you have to do in the next four days is stop me and ask questions, okay? There is a bunch of material. I can definitely skip stuff, but if I'm the only one talking in this church, it's gonna be extremely boring for everybody, okay? You're gonna have to meet at 9.30 in the morning. That's very early. You're gonna still, you know, headache from the fact that you went to the beach. So, you know, wake up, ask questions, and try to be engaging, okay? It's, it's your duty, not mine. Don't do that, it's dangerous. We take attendance, okay? There is, a, there is a piece of paper outside where you should sign your name. This is just for, you know, just getting an idea. Again, this is all free, but we want to get an idea if you really just come 
only to go to the beach. Okay, you should come also to go to the beach and for the focaccia. But you know, in the morning and the early afternoon, you should come to class. Again, this is because we start to have really a lot of application. We try to keep it free, but we have to figure out if this works or not. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? Um, some of you might need. So we're going to give certificates at the end of the course. Some of you might need uh, to take exams to get more credits or something. Usually, we try to arrange on a one-to-one -one basis. Alessandro was telling me a minute ago that we, um, what were you telling me? Wi-Fi. That uh, the only uh, Wi-Fi network you're going to have around here is uh, Eduroam, and maybe something else on the other side. So we've been kicked out from our home this week because they're doing some work. So this is the physics department. For me, it's kind of scary. This is actually where I took my first class ever. So it's like weird to be on the other side. The labs are going to be in the department of computer science, which is there, the next one over. And you have to go down in the, in the, in the bottom of the building. Okay. So the morning is going to be here, and the labs are going to be down there. Hopefully, if you manage to come this morning now, it's, it's hard the first time. The second time, typically, you get lost a bit less. Anything else? Anything else for you? Good. OK. So what we plan to do in the first, yep. Say it again. There is not an exam. I don't want to give an exam, but maybe you need it, okay? Because I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm bad about the rules, but I think the rules are like, if you take this class just as a seminar, you get so many credits, but you actually do a project, you get more credits, okay? Some of you might need that. If you do, send us an email or ping one of us, okay? Typically what we do is either a report on the labs or maybe we, we, tr we tend to discourage personal projects because there are way too many for us to, uh, you know, to be able to to be of any use, but typically some we try to force you to do something small and something related to the course. Okay. Other questions? Giovannino, questions? Okay. All right. So in the next couple of slides, we're just going to go through quickly some basic ideas, and then uh, I'm going to switch to the real slides, the hardcore one in LaTeX, where we actually set up our annotation and we start to introduce the concepts. Okay? Uh, what is machine learning? Well, hopefully, you know, I, a lot of you have ideas, but in some sense, these days, it seems to be something that sits in between two seemingly unrelated ideas, the idea of analyzing data and the idea of building intelligent systems. Okay? Right now, we almost give for granted that these two things are related, but definitely this was not the case at the beginning of the whole idea of artificial intelligence. Uh, if we go a bit back, what we see is that, I mean, again, I'm going to take the uh, intelligence perspective just for a couple of slides, okay? And if you think about what is intelligence, of course, we don't really have much more than a working definition, the one given by Turing, which is basically the idea that if a computer can f or an artificial machine can fool a human, then it means that it passed some form of intelligent test, okay? I imagine that all of you are familiar with this. True? Uh, the one thing that you should notice here is that as soon as you think one second about all the things that a machine needs to do in order to be able to interact with a human, you have a list of skills that go from language, manipulation, maybe capability of reason about stuff, memorize about stuff, uh, learn from experience, and so on. And basically what turned out that basically all these skills in the for some reason that you're going to recall in a second, became different fields, okay? Separated fields. While they're all aspects of intelligence, they become somewhat different fields. And people that typically do one of these things don't meet with the other people doing this thing. Why was this the case? Well, 
again, this is kind of a bird eye view of a history of artificial intelligence and machine intelligence. And what you see is that one reason why this was probably the case is because we vastly underestimated the difficulty of producing intelligence machines. There is now a famous, infamous meeting that happened in Dartmouth in the 60s about basically all the big shots uh, that started the field of artificial intelligence, where unfortunately the take home message there is that they thought they were going to solve the problem in a summer. Okay, so they said, uh, you, you're going to do language, okay, and you, you're going to do vision. Let's meet in September to just build a humanoid robot and just kill everybody. Okay, this didn't happen. It turned out that everything was order of magnitudes more complicated than they actually estimated, and as a consequence, there started to be specialization, okay, and people start to do a bunch of different things. And uh, if you want, the story is also that, at, uh, she's the youngest student I've ever had. <laughs> Uh, but it's not her first machine learning course. <laughs> so if you look at the story of this stuff, what happened is that uh, not much happened, okay? We had great promises, great expectation, and then you basically have to go really, really, really recently in time to see some successes, okay? To some extent, the advent of search engines was one big step. Today, we can kind of write some random stuff in Google and he's actually going to return something that is surprisingly meaningful. Or uh, if you want, there was stuff like uh, beating chess players, okay, in the 90s. That was one of a big shot. But this is already, you know, almost, what is it, almost 20 years ago, okay? And what happened before? Again, not a lot, not a lot, okay? There's been a lot of great work, but not a lot of outcomes, so to say. <coughs> so let's see. I apologize if you've seen these videos tons of time because I've been very lazy updating that, but this is kind of a video, uh, this was probably like 15 years ago more or less. This is a video, there was a, some you know, project at MIT in Tommaso Poggio's lab. This gives you an idea of technology, so to say, not technology, but like science, uh, 10, 15 years ago. What you see is a video of something that should recognize pedestrians, and what you see basically that it, yeah, it's okay. Okay, he put a, a, a bounding box around the pedestrian when he sees one, and every once in a while he decides that a window or a traffic light is a pedestrian. Okay, around that time, people decided, well, maybe this is good enough to actually make money out of it, or is it? Okay, if you want to make money out of something like this, say for example you want to have a car that is not going to kill everybody who's walking around it. Uh, well, the pr think of a second of the percentage of success you need to ensure. Okay, it's high. Okay, one out of a thousand is not enough because if one out of a thousand is going to sue you for them because you killed somebody, well, you run out of business pretty soon. <coughs> now, this again is uh, is what we are doing today. Okay, basically systems based on vision that can break a car on the basis of their perception are now available, and they work pretty well. Uh, this is a technology made by a company called Mobileye in Israel. It has been working on this for quite a while right now, and it's mounted on a bunch of different cars. This one is a, a Volvo Ad. There's the supercar at work, the guy who shouldn't drink coffee. Uh, <sighs> and she's alive. <laughs> by the phone, <laughs> by the phone is very warm. Okay, so uh, this is just uh, the one weird view you're going to see throughout my whole boring classes of equations and so on in, in, in a week. And, uh, and this is just to say something's actually happening in the last five years, okay? This is actually probably five years old. Uh, a lot of stuff is happening. All of a sudden, we see intelligence everywhere. Uh, this is system at like, uh, you know, more uh, s slowed up speed. This system is actually mounted on cars, okay? So it works at the precision, which is the one that allowed these people to actually sell it. 
And this is just one example out of a tons, and this is again my lazily update list of things that we kind of start to give for granted, okay? We can sit in front of a computer and do crazy things, and we can actually control the computer with Kinect. Okay, how do we do that? Okay, this is pretty amazing. Or we can whistle a song, or we can make the phone listen to a song, and it's gonna tell us who's playing. <coughs> the one that I usually show, but my, my phone is not working now, is the Google Translate uh, by voice, which I find completely crazy. I can speak my English or Italian, it's gonna translate on the spot and speak, which means that in a few years, Presumably, we could have something we sit in our ear, and I can go to Japan and speak, and they're going to understand what I'm saying. And this sounds this, this sounds really like science fiction a few years ago. Okay, I, I in the interest of time, I skipped it, but I usually show a video of um, speech recognition system ten years ago. You remember them? Hi, I'm Lorenzo. What did you say? Hi, I'm Lorenzo. What did you say? You know, this is common experience. This goes on and on forever. Right now, they're not perfect, but they're fine. They're fine. They're fine enough that we can use them. I can call somebody on my phone without using my fingers, and it kind of worked. Okay? Uh, and I guess this year, the biggest news was this big jump uh, uh, taken by Google with Google DeepMind with this artificial player of the game of Go. Okay, where there the stunning thing is that unlike Deep Blue, the number of movements, you know, the number of things you can do on a board in Go is so big that you cannot just take it down brute force by trying all different, all different uh, strategies, okay? Like you can probably do in simple games like backgammon and maybe even in chess. Here's something more needs to be done, and these systems are trained, okay? They do really use some form of experience, and they, to, you know, get the results they get. <coughs> uh, how do we do this stuff? Well, in a single word, with computers and with data and with the stuff that sits in the middle that allowed us to crunch the data in the computers in a meaningful way. And this whole course is about ways to do this one thing that sits in the middle. Uh, this is going to be quick. I just want to remind you that there is this one part, most of the course is going to be on supervised learning, okay, aside from the last part. The reason is that this is somewhat the most subtle part of the theory, and a lot of the ideas that you find here translates kind of almost in exactly the same way to unsupervised problems, where just we have a little bit less understanding. What we want to do in the next few slides is just remind you how there is a phase where you look at the problem, and then the rule is to find what is the input and what is the output and then you forget about the problem to some extent and you just squeeze it in a machine learning framework. So the simplest example is this one that I stole from Coursera. Is the idea of, uh, uh, well, let's do it one step at a time. The idea is that you know how big is a house, you want to provide the price, okay? And you have a bunch of examples of house, size and prices, and then you want to give, say, okay, given a new house, I check how big it is, and I want to give the price. Super simple, okay? This is the case where you can even plot stuff because it sits on one line. You have the input, the output, and you can even draw them, okay? And the question is, okay, what are the problem here? Well, the problem is that we don't have infinitely many houses and infinitely many prices, okay? There might be some uh, lunatics that decided that his house was small but was beautiful, so it was you know worth five million dollars, and this is going to create some noise, okay? And all this kind of stuff can happen. Of course, the more you observe, the better you would be, but you maybe you don't observe that much, okay? Also, why should you just look at the? Suppose that you really want to make some money. Probably you, you're not going to just look at the size of a house, right? You want to add more information. For example, you can look at the size of the house and the number of bedrooms and keep on going. And you see immediately that the, the simplistic way of just being able to draw things won't stop working pretty soon. Here, I'm not going to change the notation of the input, but you see in this case, the input is just one number, whereas in the second case, the input is two numbers. Okay? And why just two? How about we say whether it has a view or not, whether it has a garden or not, and we keep on going. We can make that large, 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 large. On the other hand, the output will simply be the price. Okay? So this is the basic, basic example. I imagine this is clear for everybody. So again, you start to see a structure of a problem here. You have inputs, you have outputs, you see some of them, and what you want to do is to be able to find the, a relationship between input and output that you can apply on new input that you have not seen before. This is the whole notion of prediction or generalization, 
Okay? <clears throat> and already in what we saw, just in these five seconds, there is some rule of the game. For example, the fact that you will always start from a partial view of this function, okay? You will only have some samples, and out of the samples, you'll, be, you'll need to build a, a more coherent and more faithful view of what's going on, okay? So already here, you start to see nuggets of ideas that we're gonna make precise in a second. And the next few slides are just running through a couple of examples, just to remind you how this framework is pretty general. So the game here is, again, I give you a problem, and we think how we can turn it into an X, Y, kind of problem, okay? So for example, say I give you emails and they are spam, okay? Or I give you, let's say this, or I give you pieces of news that are different topics. How do I turn this problem into something which is X and Y? Anybody knows? Come on. The promise was that you were gonna entertain me. Perfect. So what he just said, can you hear me? Can you hear him? I, I hardly can, so we'll have to repeat all the time. So what he said is, pick a text, okay, and then just count the currents of words. Okay, then you're gonna be a, have a vector where you say this word appeared, this word didn't appear, this word appeared 15 times, the word appeared 12 times, and this every text become a vector, okay? And then the output is just spam or not. Okay, so it's again a case where what you do is given a dictionary of words, you go in and check whether this word appears and you put the counting. And then it means that each text is gonna become just a vector. Then it's gonna be a very sparse vector. It's gonna be an extremely sparse vector, exactly. So most words you don't find, okay? Especially if you take out, say, uh, articles and things like this. So it's gonna be an extremely sparse vector. And the idea is that few words and also, you know, the other observation, you're really destroying everything in that poor text, okay? A text is just gonna become a collection of words. Yet again, this is just, a, you know, a, the simplest uh, code that you can think of to turn the problem into an X and Y problem. <coughs> and by the way, if you think about the way you, people do things like this, it's more or less the same, right? You just take a text, you count the words, and you make them, visually, you make them bigger if you find them many times. So we don't care about this stuff, but, you know, this is done in the same way. <coughs> okay, I don't care about this. So, images, okay? Suppose that I give you images of faces and non-faces, okay? How do you turn the problem into an X and Y problem? Each input is an image, okay? The output is easy. Is, is it a face or not? How do you turn an image into a vector? I just heard blah, blah, blah. But I assume this is easy, so you can do smart stuff, but if you don't want to do more smart stuff, you just take the pixels and you unroll them, okay? One after the other until you get a big vector. Again, you destroy almost everything, you can do a lot of stuff, you can take histograms, you can do this, you can do that, but it's pretty clear that you can turn the problem, at least to begin with, into an X and Y problem, okay? <coughs> or finally, biology, okay? Maybe this is a kind of an outdated pro uh, um, version, but you have patients, okay, and you want to be able to assess how uh, heavy is their disease, if it's less, more or less aggressive, okay? And the hope is that you're gonna go in, read out their genetic uh, expressions, okay? Get an idea of what are their genes doing, and then try to figure out whether they belong to class A of patients or class B, okay? These two kinds of diseases are gonna be the output. The input is basically, there is a bunch of technology in which you can go in and read out the expression of each gene, okay? So each patient is gonna become a long list of activity of genes. So you have all the genes, and then you see in this patient, these guys are active, these guys are sleepy, okay? So again, you get this long list of activation, and this becomes your representation. As and since somebody mentioned it, the first example I show you was very low dimensional, right? Was 1, 2D, at least in the way I phrased it. The second example I showed you was sparse, the text example. The vector of the X had mostly zero. The other two examples, 
they're horribly high dimensional. Okay, you have images. Think of an image. How many pixels you have an image? A lot. Okay, order of thousands or tens of thousands. Okay, so and they're all numbered, non different from zero. Will they all matter? Probably not, and we'll have to think about that. But the rough format is just the tons of numbers, okay? And in the genes, same. Probably there is going to be no single gene that is completely sleepy, but only some of them will be really important. Also, will all the numbers in the vectors will be all independent to each other? Probably not, right? If you take an image of my face, what's happening around here? It's very much related, okay? And what happens here and here is also very much related. So there is a lot of strong relationship with these numbers that you observe. So while they look very high dimensional, you can argue that there is some structure going on. And so this high dimensionality is somewhat no, not so scary, okay? If things were really high dimensional and like completely unrelated, there would be little hope to do any learning at all. Okay, if you have an input which is really 10,000 dimension or 15,000 dimensions and you have, I don't know, a thousand, 12,000, a million points, it's going to be very hard to get anything out of it. And so this is what we want to do, okay? What we want to do now is just jump in, okay? Having this bird eye view of what's going on in machine learning and now set up a language and then start describe algorithm to tackle this class of problems. Any questions about this first part? You're too quiet, eh? You're not going to work in a minute. Questions? Comments? Giovanni? Come on. Eric? What is? Okay, so this is... You're, you're forgiven because this is just a warm-up, okay? There is not much going on here. Let me just point out that we kind of say a bunch of pictures, but we also start to touch upon some actually very important ideas. First of all, the idea that we work with function approximations or functional learning, where we have input and output and we've got a function, that our data are typically high-dimensional, possibly with some hidden structure. <coughs> and they're always finite, okay? We don't have access to infinitely many data points. We always have to work with somewhat potentially large but still limited picture of what's going on in the world. And this is enough once we combine tools to handle this with computers and large amounts of data to actually solve complicated problems in a way that seemed to be somewhat out of reach 10 years ago, but is now becoming uh, something possible. So what we want to do now is actually take these basic ideas and throw a lot of notations at them and symbols and make it very complicated, okay? That's what we're going to do next. As we said, everything starts with data, okay? And most of our discourse is going to be about supervised data, where what you have is both the input and the output, and you assume that new data is going to be given to you. This is just one version of the problem. Typically, you can think of a situation where you have just some inputs where you don't have labels, or maybe you have a union of the two, okay? What you call semi-supervised. And somewhat a mixture of this thing is probably going to be the one that we should be uh, thinking about. But as of now, we really know how to handle this problem, and we're still struggling to understand what is the best way to handle these kind of problems, okay? So in the in my selection of classes from the big course at MIT, I somewhat left out this part, but you do find some ideas along that line in the longer version of the course. Uh, so again, you're given data, okay? In this case, how many dimension is the input? Very good, okay? The output is just uh, uh, binary. The idea is that at some point, somebody is gonna give you this uh, new points, and you don't know which is which color they belong, which class they belong to. So do you want to find some function? Here I'm cheating a little bit on what is this function. And this is going to be the whole game, OK? So this is the informal version of the problem. You give x and y, a bunch of them, find the function. But the function should work on new points and give me new prediction, OK? <coughs> All right. Does that make sense? This was a bit easy, so now we try to spice it up a little bit, okay? <coughs> so, you take the input cross the output to be a probability space with measure rho. 
You assume the data to be IID with respect to this measure. You take a loss function, and technically you need this loss function to be measurable. You define the expected risk. You would like to minimize it. You cannot, but you have the data. Clear? So this whole class is going to be basically going one by line. For the next hour, we're going to go line by line and see what this stuff means. Okay? So in an hour, if you don't know what this means, it's going to be a problem. So we start to read it at a normal speed, not two per. We still, you see we're going to have the data. That's good news, because that's the one thing we started from. And you know, we want to say that this data is going to give information about some future data. So we better assume there is a model underlying this data. And we're going to assume that there is a probabilistic model. Okay? Then we try to make deterministic prediction into a probabilistic world. Okay? You give me random data, and yet I was going to say, is this a face or not? So I am bound to make errors. And that's why I introduced a measure of error, and I call it the loss function. Then I'm in a good shape to say what is that I can do and what is that I would like to do. What is that I would like to do is to get something that has small errors on everything. All the possible data points that are ever going to arrive. And this is what you call the expected error. In practice, this is exactly what you would like to minimize. But you cannot, because you don't know everything. All you will know is this, the training set, the set of points you have. And so we want to start from that to try to build algorithms. Again, what we're going to do next is that we're going to somewhat, hopefully boringly for most of you, because it means that you already know this stuff, but somewhat slowly take a peek in all the ingredients one by one and try to get a better grasp of what they mean. Okay? <coughs> the first ingredient is the data space. There is some input space and some output space. In all the example I discussed, the input space was made of what? Features, but features is a name that I don't even know what it means. But there were array of numbers, okay, list of numbers, vectors, okay. This is the classical example. In the output, we already see two possible situations. One was was real numbers, the price of the house. The other case where when it was classification, red and blue face or not, and so on. Well, in fact, in some sense, as we'll see, there's going to be a bunch of simple cases. Okay, for the input space. And this is basically when we know how to sum things up. Okay? If you take two vectors, you sum them up, you get a new vector. If you take two functions, you sum them up, you get another function. And similarly, you can multiply them by numbers. This means that they have a linear structure. Okay? They're just vector spaces. And basically, this is shared by vectors, functions, matrices, and if you want to be fancy, operators. Okay? There are a lot of situations where this is not really true. Okay? The data do not come. Maybe they do come as list of numbers, but it's not really true if you sum them up, you get something meaningful. Already the case of faces or any kind of images is an example. If you, if you sum a pear and an apple, I'm not sure you get anything meaningful. Okay? And in fact, if you want, the truth is that there are a lot, a lot of cases where the input data has some kind of structure. Okay? So we're going to be, you see that when I talk about the input space, I'm not going to start by saying, oh, let's take the input space to be RD. And why do I do that? Because, well, we want to deal with cases where the input space is not RD. Okay? Maybe they're strings, binary strings, or the input space are graphs. Somebody comes to me and says, look, I have these big networks that is made of subnetworks, and I want to know which subnetworks is more lenient to have a failure and which subnetwork is actually going to be fine. So each subnetwork is going to be a graph, and I want to go in and say, this graph is good, this graph is not good, this graph is good, this graph is not good, and this graph is a little network. That make sense? So in this case, no? It doesn't make sense? No? If you want to complain, it's fine. We can just take it out. So in this case, the point is that the, and this is just a naive example, okay? But this is the case where each input is not a vector, but is just a, a, a graph, okay? And how do you handle graph? Well, there are ways, but it's not as simple as if they are just vectors. And if you want that, the other cases, maybe they are vectors, but they're special vectors. Maybe they're histograms, okay? They're a probability. So each vector has each entry between 0 and 1, and they sum up to 1, which means that each entry can be seen as a probability. In this case, again, this is a special structure, and maybe I should take that into account. We 
these are the cases where one talk about structure prediction, and these are just the cases where you talk about the linear spaces. Okay, and this is just to give you see already how in the input space there's going to be potentially a lot of richness. The take-home message out of this is just that when you see the symbol X, think of RD as the main example, but not the only example. Okay, and appreciate why sometimes you're just going to talk about the probability space, a space of object with some probability mass on them. This is because we want to handle all these different situations. Okay. You will see that more or less we we are gonna you know somewhat try to use a, a function you know definition of functions to handle this heterogeneity. Uh, the output space, for some reason, <coughs> uh, has more uh, nomenclature importance in the sense that based on the nature of the output space, you typically change the name to the problem. Okay, so if the output space is just R, just real numbers, you call that regression. If the output space is just two possible numbers, say minus one, one, zero, one, that's pretty arbitrary, you're going to call this binary classification. And then you can keep on going. You can make the obvious uh, complication of regression is when each input is going to have, have associated not one output, but many outputs. Okay. So the out is going to have vector in, vector out, or stuff in, vector out. This is what is called multitask, reg multitask learning or multivariate regression. And or you can have cases where you have um, multi-class problem. Okay? This is, again, the obvious generalization of binary classification. Instead of just two labels, you're going to have many labels. One, two, three, four, five, T, okay? Is, instead of, is this a face or not? Is this me? Is this Alessandro? Is this Raffaello, Giovannino, Eric, and all the people sleeping in the room? So, and again, of course, nothing prevents you to try to make the problem more complicated and say maybe the outputs can be also complicated, okay? They can be themselves strings, graphs, or complicated stuff. And this is what is called often structure prediction. This is complicated, okay? We, just for your knowledge, we basically know how to handle vectors, and when we do have something which is not a vector, we turn it into a vector, okay? And, you know, maybe a matrix when we want to be fancy, but that's about it. So most of the effort is going to be in designing function spaces and loss term, okay? We know how to compare two vectors. How do you compare two vectors? Well, for example, you can take the distance, okay? That's a fairly natural. But how do you compare two graphs or two strings, okay? So you will see that a lot of effort will be put in track, for example, you will not see it because we're not going to talk much about it, but you can imagine that a lot of effort is put here in trying to find good ways to compare things, okay? Because there is no obvious way. Yet again, here, here you, what you, the take home message here is there is a lot of stuff and we're just going to see the tip of it, OK? We're just going to see the initial part. This part here is pretty wild, and we're basically not going to touch much upon it, OK? And in some sense, while there are a lot of concepts that extend from here to here, really here you want us to exploit structure a bit more, OK? And that's why we focus more on the first part. All right, what was the next ingredient in our list? OK, this is going to be a boring list of ingredients, OK? So you, you, you really might want to try to engage in some discussion, because they're going, going to die. So you have the input space, the output space, and then you assume that there is some probability distribution. Why? It's written there. Well, because, you know, there is noise, there is partial information, there is a lot of things wrong in the world that you want to accommodate in your model, okay? Uh, God doesn't play chess, but sometimes, okay? So you do want to, you know, have a model that is able to accommodate for the all uncertainty and stochasticity in your problem, and you want to separate the model from the observations. Okay, so here this is just the model, okay? Something that typically you assume to exist, but you will never observe fully, okay? So the reason why you assume to exist is to reason about theory, essentially, okay? And to be guidance of what you do in practice. Because if you assume there is a model, you do certain things. If you assume there is another model, maybe you do other things, okay? <coughs> Our model is just going to be a probability distribution on the input and the output that we're typically going to split in the probability on the input and the conditional probability of the output given the input. 
okay? The one on the input, we might call it sometimes the marginal distribution, and the one on the output, we might call it the conditional distribution with not a lot of fantasy. Let's look a little bit of what they are, okay? Let's start from the conditional distribution, and let's start with the prototype example. This is an example of, the, of how to get a probability distribution, okay? It's one example of what you just show you. You fix a fixed function. So first of all, you fix x, and you assume that they're random, okay? They just be chosen at random from their domain. It, here, the domain of x is just the real line, and I'm assuming to pick them at random from some distribution. Then I somewhat more constructively build a conditional distribution. I build it, okay? And the way I build it is by choosing a function f star, which is fixed, but of course unknown, and then adding some noise, which say for the sake of simplicity is zero mean, which basically means that whenever I pick a y, it's going to be, on average, sitting on the curve f star, but it can be shifted a little bit up and down by the noise, okay? The distribution of the y is going to be exactly the distribution of EI, but now shifted, okay, in a way that depends on x. <coughs> so what you see here is that, in some sense, the distribution of the y, the conditional distribution, is essentially noise, okay? It's essentially the noise. The fact that rather than having a star, this get kicked a little bit, okay? That makes sense? So one first way, this is not the way to look at the conditional distribution, but in regression, you can look at the conditional distribution as essentially as rewriting the noise, okay? What about classification? Well, classification is a bit more complicated. You have class, first of all, notice that the conditional distribution is made of only two terms, okay? In binary classification, you have class one, you have class minus one, and that's it. So you just have point masses in one and in minus one. You have nothing else. And now, what does it mean that you have noise? Can we write down an equation like the one I showed you before? Maybe, but does it even make sense? I'm not really sure, okay? So what you can think is that in some sense, noise here is the extent to which class one given x and class one minus one given x overlap, okay? Suppose that I have a nice you know, in one dimension, I just have one pixel images, okay? I have a nice bump, and this is my face, and I have another bump, which is your face, okay? All of you. And uh, maybe this is a bit far, but and they're very separated because nobody looks look like me. <laughs> so, this is the distribution of me, okay? All my images of my faces, and this is the distribution of all of you, and they're very well separated, okay? And this is the case where there is little noise. More realistically, probably there's going to be some distribution, and some of you is actually going to look like me, and so we're going to have some overlap. And you see here, this is one case. This is me, this is you, and this is the poor people that look like me. Okay? And here there is a complicated equation that Alessandro wrote to explain what this means, but we're going to skip it. <laughs> How about the marginal distribution? <clears throat> the marginal distribution is the distribution of the input. Okay? We kind of see why, you know, we, uh, we, about the conditional distribution, we said, oh, there could be noise, but it could be more subtle things like similarity of people, okay? People that look alike. This is not noise. This is really just like a probability that, you know, if you, if you put freckles on your face, you look like me. What about the marginal distribution? Why do we care about putting a distribution in the input? Can we just say that there is no distribution there? It's just, maybe I can choose points. Well, no. In machine learning, we typically assume that you cannot choose points. The points are given to you, okay? So the marginal distribution account for the way in which the input points are given to you account in the fact that you, there might be uncertainty in the way you pick these points, okay? So there is, you know, in classical statistics, you say, oh, I have a line, I have this curve, and I take my points here, equispaced, just this much, so that I cover the whole space. Well, try to do this with faces against known faces. How do you go in this 10,000 dimensional space and design something that is meaningful? As, and then how do you go and pick those pictures? I want a picture which is in corner one, 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 one. Well, you don't know how to do that. So what you're given is just a bunch of pictures, okay? And out of those pictures, you have to try to make something useful. So what we do here is that we assume that there is a distribution of the input, okay? And we just sample according to it. 
And here you just have an idea, okay? Again, imagine that I don't tell you the labels, but this is how the distribution of the input look like. You can kind of see that something is going on, okay? There, is my, there might be already some structure in there. Okay, so one first way to see why we want to introduce marginal distribution, and again, this, this, the reason are just some among many, okay? Is in this case, is to account for the uneven sampling. Uh, this is a complicated comment, but I want to try to make it anyway. We're going to be a bit picky. We will often write instead of this, okay? Typically, you see stuff like, you know, you, when you write an integral or an expectation, write like this. Sometimes I'm going to write it like this. The reason why we do that is to stress the fact of what is this P of X, okay? Let me try to explain you why. Suppose that your input space is just two-dimensional. And say you just put the distribution, look a bit like that. You have some blob, and it has some high mass in the middle, a high probability. And then uh, at the border, it has less probability, okay? Then you can go in and you can do whatever you want. You can define densities and so on. Suppose for a minute, let's make it extreme, okay? That actually, I give you an input which is two-dimensional, but really, the numbers I gave you are completely related to each other, okay? This is, of course, extreme, but let's just play with this example one second. In this case, and not only they're related, they're related linearly. I've been so crazy that I've been taking two numbers that are one proportional to the other. In this case, what you have is that the distribution is going to look like this, right? The data live in two dimension, but really they live on, the, on just one line because they're related. What is the volume of this line? What is the volume of the line? Zero. Okay? It's like a point in 1D. It doesn't have any volume. And the problem is that when you define densities, densities is basically say, I take the mass that I put on something and I divide by the volume. Okay? The, the one you see here is just the distribution, the mass that I think something has divided by the usual volume defined in the standard way. And here we're just saying, well, be careful, because sometimes things it, are, it might not be as easy. You might have things that lie on simple, structured uh, things with zero volume. And then the you can still do stuff. You basically have to renormalize the volume, okay? And say, well, I have just to you know, go in, restrict, and so on. This is a simple case, just to make it a bit more friendly. Think of this to be a cube in 3D, and this to be a surface in 2D. Okay? Then you do have a measure, you see it. Okay? It's just that you have to restrict. Okay? If you look at the surface in 3D as zero volume, but if you look at the surface itself, you do see a volume, you see the surface. Okay? So again, this is a bit complicated, and I don't really mean to, you know, this is not so important, but all I want to say is, sometimes we stick to this notation, we stick to it just as a reminder that things might not be occupying the whole space, but they might occupy some small portion of it, in which case you have to be a bit careful in the way you define densities. Okay? So this is the take-home message. I don't want to think about volume measure, manifolds, and so on, but this is what's hidden in here. And all I'm saying here is, don't think that you always have stuff which is the usual stuff in high dimension with the usual density. Be a bit careful on it. Okay? Then, of course, now you can complain about this and say, well, this is crazy. Why would things lie on line? Well, probably they don't. They probably have some nonlinear complicated structure among them. Plus, there is noise. So probably they're not exactly on a line, but they're close to a line. Now, make this in very high dimension, say the images of faces. Take the space of all possible images that are 100 by 100, and take the space of my faces. Okay, the set of my faces. If you take a point at random in a 100 by 100 space, of course it will not be my face. So maybe we could argue that my face are going to occupy some small region, and because of all the correlation between all the pixels in my face, maybe this is going to be some kind of, not exactly, but close to a lower dimensional surface. Not dimension 2 or 1, very, still very high dimensional, but not 100 by 100, much lower dimensional. Okay, so this is a bit complicated, but this is like a negative information that you should have. And whenever you see this, 
you should not blame me for just using a complicated symbol, but just think of this as a reminder, okay, of this idea that there might be lower dimensional structure in high dimensional signals. Does this make sense? So, it's going to be a long day. We have data, we have distribution, we want to make prediction, we need to way to measure errors. Because data are random and I make prob deterministic prediction. It's not that I have to do it, but if you give me an image, you're not going to say, yeah, this can be me or you. Okay? You can actually say confidence. I think I'm confident this is me, but it will also be you. Okay? But what we're going to do is to try to make it simple and just to say yes or no. Okay? Or give me a price, not a distribution over the price. There is a whole bunch of literature more ambitious than this, but we're going to be uh, more humble than that. Okay? So what we need to do is to measure errors, which means that I give you effects, you tell me why, and then I have to say what is the price I pay. Notice that if you remember my first dense slide, this was part of the problem because eventually, given the loss, I do define my problem as try to minimize the loss over a possible example. Okay? So this is an important thing that somewhat defined the whole problem. Let's make a few examples. Regression and classification. It turns out that in regression, things usually depend on the distance between things. Okay? Which makes sense. I give you a number, I give you another number, the real numbers to measure how far they are. You take distance, you take the difference, and then you decide how you want to treat the difference. You can take the square, you can take absolute value, you can take something else. Okay? And here you see a plot. If you plot here the difference, you have the square loss, it's just the square of the distance. It's smooth, it's convex. If you take the absolute loss, this is actually going up much slower, okay? linearly. And right here, you cannot differentiate it because the left and right derivative are different. Okay? Or you can take the fence here, which basically say, really, when I'm close to there, I set it equal to zero. This is so-called epsilon insensitive loss. Uh, classification. Classification is a slightly different story because this seems to be the loss function. Okay? What is the loss function in binary classification? You have faces and not faces. You're given a new image. I say, it's me. It's a face. And you say, no, it's not. How much shall we pay for this error? One. And what if I get it right? Zero. And of course, you say, no, I want to pay 10 and zero. Well, whatever. You do what you want. But it's like one number and another one. Okay. So counting errors is kind of the default way to make count mistakes in classification. Okay? It's by no means the only one, but it's the most natural one. If you go and check, you can basically see that the way you can write this measure of error, which is useful, you can say, well, I check if this is equal to that, and if it's not, I count one. But you can also do another thing. You can take, I take this, I take f of x, I take y, and I take their product. If they have the same sign, I'm happy. Because this is positive, this is positive, and they have the same sign. If this is negative and this is negative, I'm also happy. Okay? 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. If they have the wrong sign, eh, there's something going wrong. Because I'm going to say, I get a function, I say positive, but truly is negative, or the other way around. So what you see is that all the loss function in classification, they do can be written, they can be written as the product of y and y prime, okay? Where y and y prime are just some uh, values in the output space. So the product seems to be the natural quantity to look at in binary classification. The one you see here is just the indicator function, so it's the step function, okay? It basically says, it's a bit perverse, you know, this is the standard way of writing it, so I, I keep using it. You take the product, then you take a minus. So usually when they have the same uh, uh, sign, you don't want to pay error, so here what you have is that this is just the loss that, you know, is zero here and is, um, yeah, so, and it's uh, uh, equal to one here. It makes sense. What's the problem with this loss function? It's not convex. It's not smooth. 
it hardly has any properties that make it useful in practice. Okay? So it's beautiful. It makes a lot of sense. From an information theoretical perspective, it's exactly what you want to do. But there's not a lot of other things you can do aside from thinking about information theory, because this is non-differentiable and non-convex. And when we are missing both, there's not a lot that you can do. Okay? And in fact, what you can see is that this stuff gives really rise to problems that are not computable in any reasonable way. So what you typically do is that you try to replace this with another loss function, which is going to be convex and an upper bound. Okay? So one way is to say, how about I take something which is linear? So I want something that is linear, and then it goes to 0. Okay? But it also has to go above this thing. So I want something linear, it passes above this, and then it goes down as fast as possible. It turns out that this is the shape of that thing. It's one, goes down with the um, slope one, and then in one here, in the x-axis, it becomes zero, and it stays flat. This is what is called the hinge loss, okay? And it's the loss function used by super vector machines. In some sense, it feels like the more tight, convex relaxation of the zero-one loss. If you want something convex that goes above the zero-one loss, that kind of feels like the tightest possible, okay? And it kind of has the same smell, because it pays error on one side, and it doesn't pay error on the other side. The logistic loss, which is a slightly more complex uh, um, expression, is similar. It goes down slowly, but it never gets to zero, okay? It decreases. On the other hand, while this is convex, sorry, while the hinge loss is convex, but it is non-smooth, right? Because if you look here, in the point where it goes from linear to flat, it's not differentiable. Again, the left derivative is minus 1, and the right derivative is 0. So they don't agree. The logistic loss keep on going down in a smooth way, OK? And finally, there is a weird one that actually turns out to make sense, but you don't really see it from here, which is the square loss. OK? First of all, I wrote the square loss in a kind of a strange way. In the previous slide, the square loss was y minus y prime. OK? is the usual way. But here, I write it like this. So an exercise for you is to show how to do that. OK? How to go from this expression to this expression. And the key point here is that in this slide, y is only 1 or minus 1. It doesn't take any, or, or, uh, any other value. Okay? You can use this fact to rewrite the loss function this way. So you do see that also the, loss, the square loss can be written as just a, a function of the product. What is the problem with this loss function, at least from this picture? Well, not the problem, but it feels there is something off about this loss function. What is it? Yeah, but this is true also for the others, right? Also for the logistic, for the hinge, for all of them. It's true that you get an error which... So what his complaint was, you get things that are not 1 and 0. But this is true for all of them, okay? What is the main difference? Uh, right, so it does something weird here. All the other laws says, on the right side, don't make mistake. Don't pay, okay? This one here seems to say that you also have to pay. So from this plot, you might have the impression that the square loss is not a good loss for classification. Okay? It turns out that, in fact, it is, because this is just a partial view on the problem, and we're going to see another one in a second. Okay? And in fact, you're probably going to the lab and you touch it with your own hands. So let me skip this. Uh, given the loss function, we can now say what we would like to do. Yep. So his comment is just a, uh, so his comment is just a problem of me being sloppy, and he's basically saying if y and y prime can both be only one and minus one, why do I bother writing the whole thing and worry about everything? Okay, it's a very reasonable question, and the reason is that I'm being a bit sloppy here. Okay, what you do in classification, 
is that ideally you would like to take y and y prime to be both 1 and minus 1. But in practice, what you're going to do is that you're going to take the y prime is typically going to be so y prime is typically going to be f of x. Okay? So y is really going to be the label, but y prime, say, one of the two, is going to be f of x. And when you have to go down and really solve problem, f of x is just going to be a real number. Okay? You take, typically that's what you do, you take a function which is a real number, and then you take the sign of f of x to make a decision. So when you have to minimize something, you have to minimize this. So if you want to be slightly more precise, For example, in binary classification, I wrote that L goes from Y to Y into zero plus infinity, but really I should put here R. Okay, so one of them will be minus one and minus one, but the other could be R. And then that's why I plot everything. Does that make sense? I was trying to hide this, but you spotted me. Yeah. <laughs> The product of these guys. Okay. Yes, because here, the um, yeah, this is uh, you should always put the label of the axis. This is an important lecture, and uh, this is y minus y prime. Okay, so here I'm plotting the argument that I wrote here. Okay, so this one here is y minus y prime. This one here is this argument here. Okay, and if you see, you see that it makes sense here. Look at the square loss. This is just the parabola, okay, shifted by one. If you look at this as it was just x, okay, and here is is the instead this is just the parabola exactly in zero, okay, good. Okay, let's move on. As we said, we have the data, we have distribution, we have the loss, now we can say what we would like to do. What we would like to do is to minimize the future error. Okay? And the future error is what I wrote here. If you want, this is the expectation of the error over all possible input and outputs. All of them. Okay? All possible x and y. <coughs> of course, would require knowledge of rho to be computed, would require knowledge to the whole distribution to be computed. The reason why we introduce it, because in the ideal quantity that we would like to make small. And here, aside from technicalities, under minor assumption, this quantity is essentially defined over all possible reasonable function. Okay? You don't make, no, to define this quantity, you don't have to make restrictions. You can take basically all of them, okay? up to some minor technicalities. Um, if we look a bit more, of how this quantity changes if we change the loss function, we get a little bit of insight of what is the role played by a loss function. Right now we just plotted them, right? We could ask another question, which is, if I try to minimize this quantity over all possible functions, what do I get? This is not a practical enterprise, okay, to some extent, because you won't be able to do this, because this quantity cannot be computed. But still, mathematically, you can try to derive an expression and then see if for one loss function and the other loss function, they're different. Does this make sense? It's kind of a decision theoretic perspective. You say, suppose that I know everything and I can compute stuff. Let's see if there is any difference in the choice of the loss function. If you take the square, I'm not going to do these computations. They're relatively easy. The trick is that you basically take this expression, the, you fix x, you split the integral in the part on x and the part on y, so that you can basically see that at some point you can just uh, um, reduce everything to the just computing f of x, okay, a value which is a real number. So uh, whatever I just said is completely incomprehensible. What I mean is that there is a little trick that makes the computation uh, elementary. Okay? You don't need complicated mathematical tools. And then you can play a bit, and you see that for the square loss, you get this quantity. Okay? The minimizer of the squared error expected over the whole distribution is this quantity here, which is called the regression function. What is it? You fix x. And then you have to assign a value. What is this value? 
is the expectation of all the possible values of y. Okay, it's just expectation. So you sit on a point, you have that there is a whole distribution of points output, and then you just take the average. Okay? And you do that for every single point. So if you are using the square loss, you're shooting for the expectation of the conditional distribution. Okay? Is this the same things you're shooting if you choose another loss? Let's take, for example, the absolute loss, okay? The absolute value loss, the one without the square. Then you can see that if you do the same computation that leads you to this, you don't get the average, the mean, but what you get is that the median of the conditional distribution, okay? So by changing the loss function, you're effectively choosing a different function you're choosing as your target. And these are just two examples. And if you want, this is kind of, you know, it resonates with intuition, which is I take the square loss, I pay more for errors that are far away. This looks a bit not robust. If I take the absolute value, it pays linearly of the error that are far away, so it looks more robust. And, you know, the only thing that I know about robustness is that typically the median is a more robust estimator than the mean. Okay? And here you kind of see this, uh, this thing popping out. It's a bit sloppy, but the main take-home message here, you choose the loss, you change the target. What about classification? Well, the gaming classification is a bit different. Again, I can go in and check what's going on with the zero-one loss, and you get something reasonable. Here it's written in one way, but the take-home message here is you take class one, the conditional probability of class one given x, you take the conditional probability of class minus one given x, and then you check which one is bigger, and then you make your decision. This is the most sensible thing to do if you're just counting errors. It turns out that it's actually optimal in the sense that it minimizes the expected risk. Okay? Yet again, this comes from a loss that you cannot handle. So what about using other loss function? What are their targets? Are they the same one or slightly different? Well, choose the square loss. This is what you get. Okay? If you think about it, if you think about here, do the exercise just to wake up. Suppose that y can just be 1 or minus 1. How do you rewrite this expression? Well, you have 1, row 1 given x, minus 1, row minus 1 given x. And that's it, because there's nothing else. So that's exactly what's written here. Okay? Is this the same as this? Well, not quite, right? It's exactly the observation we just made. This quantity is a real number, okay? It's the difference between two probabilities, but it's a real number, whereas this one is just 0, 1. But if I take the sign of this, they look the same. True enough? So, 1. If I change the loss function, and I take, for example, the square loss, I'm changing the target, and I don't get back to this simple decision rule. But what I get is actually close enough. If I take the sign, I actually get back directly to it. This shows a couple of things. One, taking the sign seems to be a reasonable idea, at least for the square loss. Two, the square loss is almost going to the right place. It's just solving a slightly more complicated problem. Rather than just choosing the sign, it tried to estimate the difference of the probabilities. Okay? So while the plot I showed you before suggested that the square loss was going in the wrong place, this calculation shows that it's just fine. It just is shooting at a bit more than just the sign. It's shooting at the difference of the probabilities, from which you can read out the sign, of course. So this is one way to see why, from an information theoretical perspective, the square loss is just fine. Logistic loss, similarly, you get a quantity which is not a real uh, zero or one, is the ratio, is related to the ratio of the probabilities, and again, it's fine if you take the sign. The hinge loss, you remember that the hinge loss seemed to be the tightest convex relaxation, and somewhat miraculously, its target is exactly the one of the zero one loss, okay? The sign is already there. Of course, with finite data and all, you're going to get real values. But if you were allowed to use any possible function, and if you're allowed to use infinite amount of data, so pretty good life, then the hinge loss would give you exactly this. So in some sense, it does really seem to be the loss function which is best tailored to classification. Okay. <coughs> all right. 
So I have to stop in 15 minutes, correct? Yes. We are in a pretty good shape now, OK? Because you're basically what we're saying is there is the data, there is the distribution, there are good reasons why we want to make the setting probabilistic, there are loss functions, there are different choices, and the different choice of loss function somewhat define different notion of targets from our learning problems. OK? This is where we are right now. We'll see there are other considerations that might make a loss function uh, preferable to another. What we want to do in the last 15 minutes is introduce what is a learning algorithm, when it's good, and when it's not. So a learning algorithm is a procedure that, given the data, return a potential function. Okay? It is the one thing that you have to notice here is that, typically, the output of a learning algorithm is random. Okay, it is a function, but it depends on the data, and so it will be a random quantity. If you give it the same training set, you're going to get the same function out, and that function is going to make decisions. But if I give you another training set, you might get another function out. Okay, so here I'm hiding a bit technicality on how nice this has to be. Then, what is a good algorithm? From a statistical perspective, an algorithm is good if it gives me an error which is close to the best possible error. OK? So this is what is written here. The algorithm is a set is good if the error that I would like to minimize but I cannot is close to the best possible error. This would be ideal. Right? So if I want to prove a theorem about an algorithm, I should try to shoot for this. This is the quantity that we would like to prove is small. An algorithm is good if I can prove that this is small. We have to be a bit careful because, again, f of et is a quantity that depends on the training set. So what does it mean that this is small? It has to be small for one training set, for two training sets, for three training on average on all training set, or you can say that it has to be small for most training sets. Okay? So. This statement here, while a bit technical, it says the size, the probability is over possible training sets, and it says that the size, the number of training sets for which these two are not close disappears if the number of points goes to infinity. Okay? So this is what this equation says. When I make a statement about the performance of the algorithm, I have to say, with respect to which training set I want it to be nice. And here I'm saying that one basic property is that the number of bad training sets should disappear as the training set get bigger and bigger. Does it make sense? It's almost a sanity check, OK? If I get more data and I keep on getting more and more bad training set, well, maybe my life is wrong. OK, so it's sensible. What's missing? Is this enough? Would be happy if I show you an algorithm that has this property? Reasonably happy. Again, you know that the algorithm is going to be able to exploit data coming in. What is somewhat disappointing in this requirement? Is there anything more that you would want? This just tells you that as the number of points goes to infinity, the bad training set disappears. What more would you want? how fast it is. Or in other terms, suppose that I give you n points, how many bad training sets you have. Okay? So this you can do, but basically, exactly, this is given a precision, given a number of points, you can check how, ma how many bad training sets you have. Okay? This is the size of an upper bound on the size of the bad training sets. Okay? So this is a quantitative statement. The first one is an asymptotic statement. This is a um, statement that holds for a finite number of points. OK. It turns out, and this is enough, OK? This is basically what we want. You can massage this in a couple of different ways, OK? And we're going to do it just to introduce some names that you might see in papers. If this quantity is invertible in both n and epsilon, you can rewrite things by saying, you see, here I fix n and epsilon, and I write delta. What if I actually fix epsilon and delta, and I write n? Or what if I fix blah, 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 blah? Well, this is the one where you fix epsilon and delta, 
and you invert this relation, then you're going to have that this is bigger than epsilon with probability smaller than delta if n is big enough. Okay. So again, don't think too much about this equation because otherwise you, your eyes are going to go like this. But the basic idea here, you can rewrite this in a couple of different ways. One, the game is you have three parameters, epsilon, n, and delta. Fix two and read out the other one. Okay, and you can do it for all of them. The, the, the concept doesn't change. The notation gets a bit complicated. But the main point here is that these things have slightly different names. Okay, this way of writing things is what is called the probably approximately correct analysis of an algorithm, because this is approximately correct, probably. And this is called the sample complexity. It is the number of points you need to solve a problem with accuracy epsilon with delta uh, confidence, or 1 minus delta confidence. The one here is just the, you know, if the easier way to write a bound if you want to ignore probabilities, in a way. Because you write down a bound, you say, oh, the error is going to be smaller than this. And you say, but with probability 1 minus delta. Okay. So in some sense, it's the easier if you're used to you know, deterministic inequality. This is kind of, for n points, you get this bound. But really, this is in probability with probability 1 minus delta. Okay. Again, this doesn't matter too much. Just remember that this is a way to quantify the error that you make. Okay. <coughs> now. We have the setting, we have a notion of algorithm, and we know how good is an algorithm. Can we do everything? Okay. Does the optimal algorithm exist? Can we find an algorithm that is going to have a nice rate for all possible problems? If it was possible, then you can just use it. It's pretty good. Okay. But basically, and this is just one version of the problem, there is basically a theorem that says no. There is, for any algorithm you pick, I can work, and not too hard, to find a distribution for which this algorithm sucks. Okay? And you will see that while this sounds terribly worst case, when you see an actual algorithm, it's pretty obvious that it's going to suck on some problem. Okay? It's not like a, a, a crazy worst case analysis. This really happens. Okay? <coughs> now, the way we're going to tackle this, and it's a bit, I'm hiding a bit of uh, uh, points that are actually subtle and I wish only to discuss offline, but the basic idea is that one way to tackle this problem is to say, well, maybe I should shoot for a little bit less. I should replace, you see, the best over everything on the best over some space, which is large enough, okay, but it's not the whole thing. So the idea is that, unfortunately, I cannot solve any problem okay, with finite rates. And so what I'm going to do is to shoot for a little bit less for, and introduce an hypothesis space. This is the space that hopefully will be large, where I look for the best possible solution. Of course, it will be important to try to make this as large as possible. Okay? Because if I choose this to be one function, this is going to be a very easy problem. right? Because now the space h enters the definition of the problem. I give you the function that is always 1. Okay? 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. You don't even need data. Okay? You just see it once and say, oh, it's 1. So, what is the simplest example of space of hypothesis above the constant functions? The linear functions. Okay? So this is the simplest example you can think of. And immediately you should say, what the heck? You just told me you want it complicated. You show me linear functions. But the good news is that by starting from linear functions, we'll understand most of the computations. And then it will be very easy to extend the computation to more complex function spaces okay? that are going to be nonlinear and rich. The simplest case is going to be the case where you're given a set of features. And features are just uh, things that, given an input, return numbers. And then you're going to take something that looks like this. Okay? And now you can view this in two ways. If you're a fan of orthonormal bases and bases in general, you can say, oh, I take a basis, and now, now my f I write my function on a basis. Okay? 
If you're allergic to anything that looks like analysis, but you like geometry, you can say, ah, I'm taking my data and now mapping them into a new vector, phi x, by taking phi 1 of x, phi 2 of x, phi p of x, and this is just a new vector. Okay? And then I can rewrite this expression like this. So I'm just taking linear functions in this new space. So first I map my inputs into a new space. And notice that p here can be much larger than d, for example. And then I take linear functions. I'm just saying the same thing in two different ways, okay? One is a bit more analytical, one is a bit more geometric. And if you want, it's the essence of using, uh, try to exploit as much as possible the linear structure. This is a nonlinear function parameterized in a linear way by the vector w, okay? So life is going to be good for these kind of functions. What's missing here? Well, the only thing which is real, this is super powerful, okay? Because you can take p large and you can do a lot of stuff. One thing which is missing and that if you want here, how many degrees of freedom you have? D. And here, p. And what is p large enough? If I give you a problem, when is p large enough? Is a million enough? 10 enough? 5 billion enough? I don't know. Okay, how do you choose it? And there are a lot of situations where you can just say, well, I just make it big enough, okay, whatever. But you can say, well, this is a principal way to make it as large as possible. Okay, can I make it infinite? And then let my algorithm decide whether I want finite. And so if I have a thousand points, the algorithm is just going to decide what is enough. Is there a way to do that? This is going to cost us a little bit. And I'm done. So. Again, this was a bit of the tour de force. It is because, unfortunately, I have to go through notation, OK? And I'm just trying to go through all the ingredients, try to make some sense of it. The rest of the course is going to be about algorithms, OK? We're going to go through algorithm one after the other. This first one is just try to make as painless as possible just a bunch of definitions, OK? And also try to attach enough intuition to names that then you're going to see appearing again and again. Of course, if, you know, and also I'm assuming that this is not the first time you see them, okay? But if you forget about some of this, oh, how do you call that? Or just stop me, okay? Because if I start to say, you take blah, 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 and you do this blah, 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 to this blah, 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 it doesn't work. So stop me and say, what is blah, 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 okay? And this is just the list of ingredients that we, we, we introduced today, this morning. What's next is putting our hands into algorithms, okay? And today, is not going to be anything fancy. We're just going to look at essentially SVMs and logistic regression, which are fancy. They're just 20 years old, okay? But we're going to look at them in a slightly different way, okay? And uh, along the way, with my great sorrow, we're going to introduce the notion of kernels. They're actually going to allow to do what I promised you before. You're going from this infinite dimensional space. But we're going to do it in a very pragmatic, non-mathematical way in contrast to the MIT course where it take me four classes, okay? So this is gonna be admittedly a, a violation of all the nice things you can know about kernels, but hopefully you'll appreciate why they're useful. Okay, so I'm done. Any questions? Yep. No. No. Given an algorithm based on a representation that at some point you have to choose, I can still come up. So it depends on the order of things, OK? So if you choose the algorithm and the representation, so the question is, can I fool the no free lunch theorem by choosing a big enough representation? Again, no, because the moment you choose the representation, I can find a probability, a probability distribution, a problem for which this distribution will not be enough. And it's actually easy. You know, think, uh, no, how? Let's, uh, let's wake up the last thing. Suppose that I give you this dictionary, OK? Just take a new phi, linearly independent to the previous one, and say that that's the function you want to try to, you know, something that is not, cannot be spanned by this guy. It's just outside. This is going to be arbitrarily bad. It just is not there, OK? And you can think of other examples like this. So now, the no free lunch theorem is a pretty, and it's not, shouldn't worry too much. You just should remember that whenever you're learning from finite data, it's because you choose a prior, 
Okay, should it be a probabilistic prior? Should it be a constraint? But there's no way around it. And when you look at an algorithm, you usually say, okay, for which prior doesn't it work? Okay, and that's a fact of life. Other questions? Okay, so I'm bored, imagine you are too, so let's take a half an hour break, and I'm here for like 10 minutes or so if you have questions.